Hi, thank you for making it all the way to the end. <laughs> I never thought that I'd be presenting on venomous snakes and be like, wow, they are a lot less scary than the thing right before me. Um, but here you are, I'm reeling as the parent of a toddler. Anyways, so <laughs> I'm gonna talk today about snakes, venom, and hemispheric relations. I'm gonna talk about the work of cultivating interdisciplinary dialogues. And then I wanna talk as a historian about the work of connecting past and present in the service of a public health crisis. So a lot of people ask me, as a historian, how on earth did you end up writing a book about venomous snakes? You're trained as a historian of a totally different area of history. Well, I was in an archive a few years ago for a corporation that many of you will recognize the name today, Chiquita. Bananas, right? It used to be called the United Fruit Company. And they were founded back at the end of the 19th century. And I was in their corporate archive looking for some information for a completely different project when I ran across these folders full of images of snakes. They were not labeled. All I knew was what year they were from, and that was it. And I snapped a few photographs because I am a fan of snakes. I'm a fan of a lot of creatures in the natural world, and I thought, this is the end of it. <clears throat> but I couldn't stop thinking about, what are these snakes doing in this archive? Why are they here? It was just completely incongruous from anything, any reason I could think of. So I started digging. I completely abandoned my other project. And I come to find out that these snakes are in this archive because it was a project, a sub-project of this corporation that was looking to work with local species to understand how to cure snake bite from venomous snakes. These particular photos are from the Lancetia Experiment Station in Honduras, which was founded in the 1920s through the Tropical Research Wing of the United Fruit Company Corporation. And so I started looking from a historical perspective about, you know, what, what was this experiment station doing? What kinds of snakes were they working with? Who was running it? What kinds of scientists were passing through and collaborating? And started seeing these network of connections across the hemisphere. And for me, as a professor in Latin American Latino stories, those are the kinds of stories that we are interested in telling, that we are interested in amplifying, are stories that push us to think across borders and push us to, you know, decenter humans and states and institutions as the focal point of the vast majority of scholarship about our hemisphere from a social science and humanities perspective. And so, this, you know, this diving into the history of this particular experiment station in Honduras led me to learn so much about what is going on in the 21st century, 100 years later, in relation to the public health crisis of snake bite. And I come to learn that in 2017, the World Health Organization designated venomous snake bite as one of the top five global, top neglected tropical diseases. There are millions of people bitten every year across the globe by snakes. We don't even have good statistics on it because of how many go unreported, but more than two million people every year get bitten by venomous snakes. And so, starting in 2017, we start to see a huge sea change in terms of shift and funding being funneled towards this multidisciplinary community that is interested in dealing with snake bite. Um, because it was declared you know, by the WHO as this neglected tropical disease, disease. And from the perspective of a historian, I started to really see this overlay of some of the work that I was doing to excavate uh, histories of these networks of research, of people in, uh, interested in conservation work, um, and, and then these corporate actors from corporations like the United Fruit Company, and how they created these hemispheric networks of venom research from approximately 1900 onward. And one of the really interesting things that I immediately started to think about in relation to antivenom, which is the medicine that you want if you get bitten by a venomous snake, right? PSA, don't do anything other than go to the hospital if you get bitten by a venomous snake, right? That's it. Um, but the thing, at the beginning of the process, you need live snakes. And the way that we synthesize antivenoms has developed, has progressed over the last, um, you know, over the last century in terms of the advent of uh, RNA extraction technology and things like that. But at the beginning of the process, you need live snakes. And so as a historian, one of the things that I bring to the table is exploring, you know, these, excavating these histories of citizen science and who collected those snakes. How did they get to the sites of research? Um, and one of the things that 
working on this project has done for me as a historian has pushed me to reimagine different kinds of archives, particularly in geographies of this hemisphere that have been had their documentary archives ravaged by natural disasters, by uh, authoritarian dictatorships who destroy archives actively. For example, when I was at a lab that produces venom in Costa Rica a few years ago, I started thinking about, wow, how could this freezer full of venom samples actually be seen as an archive of the work that this particular in institution has done. So one of the things that I've been trying to do with this project has been to harness histories of snakes and their venom to, to the present, you know, and become involved in conversations, uh, interdisciplinary conversations of folks working across the hemisphere, such as RELAPA, and these are 13 publicly funded laboratories all working to address the problem of snake bite. So to conclude, the inter-American venom research community is currently undergoing a pivotal transformation under a global spotlight. And I'm asking how can we activate interdisciplinary connections to amplify and shed light on this hemispheric story, which is about humans, animals, and the environments that we co-inhabit. It's a story about the inequities caused by powerful multinational corporations. It's about global and community health. And it's the interplay between scientific advancement and hemispheric solidarities. Thank you very much.